This mountain in southwestern France may hold the clue to a great unsolved mystery. Two Englishmen now believe they have unraveled a thousand year old conspiracy. This marks the culmination of three years hard research and a combination of mathematical and historical investigation. The knowledge that this site contains is dangerous knowledge. It is a place of unique significance, this one precise location on the side of this mountain. It is sacred and it is fabulous. This story began a hundred years ago when a new priest arrived at the little village of Rennes-le-Chateau in the foothills of the Pyrenees. The priest's name was Berenger Saunier. He lived in the tumble-down presbytery on a stipend of six pounds a year. His devoted housekeeper was a young girl from the village called Marie de Narnaud. But the church was in sad disrepair, so the new priest began to oversee its restoration. That's when Antoine Captier's great-grandfather saw something glinting in a pile of builder's rubble. He was Saunier's bell ringer, and one night, as he was coming down from the bell tower, he saw something glinting from a pillar at the foot of the stairs. The top of the pillar had come off, and inside it he noticed a glass file. He took it out, and in it was a scrap of paper rolled up. He quickly went to the priest to give him what he had found. Nobody knows what was on that scrap of paper. But what the priest did next was excavate the aisle, the nave, and the transept of his church. Next, Saunier began to dig in the cemetery. Here, he was much more cautious. He dug at night, hoping not to be seen by the villagers. And he was helped by his housekeeper, Marie Danano. One of the graves he disturbed was that of a local aristocrat, the Lady Haute Poule, Countess of Blanchefort. Saunier's own diary records the event. September the 21st, 1891, discovery of a tomb. Then Saunier abruptly stopped all restoration work. He hastened to the cathedral town of Carcassonne, where his diary records a meeting with the bishop's deputy. Then just one word, secret. Suddenly, the poor priest had money to spend. Saunier redecorated the entire interior of his church in the gaudy taste of late 19th century Catholicism. On the edge of the village, he built a mock medieval tower and stocked it with expensive books. His builders constructed a promenade with a glass house where he kept a menagerie of exotic pets. The priest and his housekeeper posed in front of a handsome new villa with formal gardens. Saunier was rumoured to live the life of a Sybarite, drinking fine wines and dining on ducks that had been fattened with sponge fingers. Towards the end of his life, Saunier's bishop demanded to know where the money was coming from. He even suspended Saunier for a while. But Saunier never did account for the 200,000 gold francs worth half a million pounds today he was said to have spent. He died in 1917, taking his secret with him. 
he left everything to Marie de Naunau, who lived alone in the villa until a family called Corbu came to take care of her in her old age. In 1946, when I was seven, I would often see Marie. She was tiny, about five feet tall, dressed in black and covered in wrinkles. She smiled a lot and used to give us children sweets and postcards. When we were little, Marie de Narnot often told us, you're walking on gold. You could feed the village for a hundred years and there'd still be some left over. She also told my father, who had money worries, Monsieur Corbu, don't worry. One day you'll have more money than you'll ever spend. So we thought that perhaps on her deathbed she would reveal her secret. But just before she died, she had a stroke, which left her unable to speak, and so she was never able to tell my father anything. They buried her in 1953 next to the man she called My Dear Departed. Sonnier did find a small treasure in his church. He did it in front of witnesses, all of whom I have interviewed. He found three things which I saw myself, a collection of old coins, two very beautiful Visigothic jewels, a necklace and a bracelet, and a 13th century gold chalice. The discovery was not insignificant, but it certainly doesn't explain how he spent a million and a half francs in 20 years. Gérard de Sade found his explanation in the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris, where someone had deposited a curious collection of typescripts and photocopies called the Secret Dossier. Never authenticated by the library and written under pseudonyms, the Secret Dossier contained genealogies, a quasi-Masonic charter, and sketches of the aristocrat's tomb which Saunier had dug up. This led de Said to his most exciting discovery, two parchments, which purported to be the ones found by Saunier's bell ringer. What's more, they contain secret messages written in code. When I submitted the cryptographic documents that I found to officials at the cipher office, they confirmed that the documents were encoded. However, it hasn't really got us anywhere because we ended up with a message that's completely nonsensical. Shepherdess, no temptation. Poussin, Tenier, hold the key. Peace, 681. By the cross and this horse of God, I complete this demon guardian at noon. Blue apples. At this point, Henry Lincoln makes his entrance. His three BBC documentaries and a best-selling book called The Holy Blood and the Holy Grail made the mystery of Rennes le Chateau world famous. So much so that signs still ban treasure hunters from digging up any more of the village. These village streets are now very familiar to me. But each time I walk the last few yards to the church, I find myself uncomfortably aware of that extraordinary and daunting inscription above the door. Terribilis est locus iste. This place is terrible. At first, Lincoln believed Saunier had discovered buried treasure and that clues to that treasure were to be found in the two parchments with their coded messages. Perhaps if we could read the secret messages, we too could be led to the source of Sonia's wealth. The first message, in fact, is very easy to find. It's found quite simply by identifying those letters which are raised higher than the rest of the text and reading them off in sequence. It says, this treasure belongs to Dagobert II, King, and to Zion, and he is there dead. The coded message in the second parchment began, Shepherdess, no temptation. Poussin holds the key. 
Lincoln wondered if Poussin was the artist and if the shepherdess was an allusion to Poussin's best-known painting, The Shepherds of Arcadia. The obvious relevance of the painting led me to undertake a detailed examination of it, and I found what seemed to me to be a curious and rigid geometry. I sought the guidance of Professor Christopher Cornford of the Royal College of Art, who has made a special study of the geometry of paintings. As I worked on the painting, it did seem to me to become evident that there was present in the geometry of it, somewhere in this area, the presence of what could be a regular pentagon and the angles of the pentagon. The next step was to join the opposite points of the pentagon. This makes a five-pointed star. What could this imply? In fact, what is the significance of the pentacle? An ancient symbol of the occult, the pentacle seemed to indicate something of magical significance. As a result of his documentaries for the BBC, Lincoln had tremendous authority, and when he came to offer a book to the publishing community, there was tremendous excitement. I remember it very well. The agent um, was asking enormous amounts of money. We were asked to read the typescript in conditions of great secrecy, sealed rooms, security guards, confidentiality documents, and so on. Lincoln's book has been a huge success. It's been translated all over the world. It's been reprinted many times, and it has almost created a market for this kind of material in the public mind. And Berto Eco, who's Foucault's pendulum, is a kind of spoof of it, is a kind of tribute, a kind of homage to the success of that book. And it shows, I think, that both at the high end and at the low end, all kinds of people can get drawn into this story, whether you're Berto Eco or a, a, an amateur uh, historian. And there's no doubt that the publishers are ever eager to feed that market. Tomb of God, the latest book about the mystery, is published by Little Brown, who paid its authors an advance of £300,000. A former civil engineer, this is Paul Schellenberger's first book. Like millions of others, Schellenberger was fascinated by Lincoln's TV programs and has read his books. He was just browsing when he came across The Holy Place, in which Lincoln argues that the presence of occult geometry shows that the real mystery is not one of buried treasure, but of religious or mystical significance. The particular aspect of this puzzle which appealed to me with my particular background in engineering and my general interests was that the geometry that had been chosen represented something that was rigorous. In other words, geometry is an exact discipline. You are either right or wrong. Looking at the lines that Henry Lincoln drew on parchment one, it's quite clear that two of the lines he's drawn in there are justifiable. But the more he studied the book, the more he questioned Lincoln's geometry. There are various things that have been stated in, in the books that have been published on this, particularly I'm thinking of the Holy Blood and the Holy Grail, and I really needed somebody to help me with the various avenues that, that needed to be investigated. Schellenberger's partner is a busily crack shot with a passion for shooting old Winchesters. As a professional diver, Richard Andrews has worked as an underwater archaeologist. My role has been to look into the historical aspect of the story and to see if there are any connections or any links that might be relevant to our discovery. It seems fairly apparent to us that Cernier had stumbled on a secret to keep their own findings secret, they avoided academics and independent researchers like Henry Lincoln. We were to find that our investigation would not rest on Sonia alone.